Good morning, everybody. I'm Vincenzo Calla, president of OHSCA, and I'm glad that you are able to join me today. Today, we're glad to have the MP for South Surrey White Rock joining us, the Honourable Carrie Lynn Finley. Carrie Lynn grew up on Vancouver Island and went to UBC where she studied history, political science, and law, and she later studied law at other schools, including Harvard Law School. She has had a successful law practice and has appeared in all levels of court, including the Supreme Court of Canada. She was elected in 2011 for Delta uh, as the MP for Delta Richmond East and was part of many high-profile committees, and she has also served as the Minister of National Revenue from 2013 to 2015. She was not re-elected in 2015, but she was later elected in 2019 to serve a different riding of South Surrey White Rock. Carrie Lynn was recently named the Conservative Party's lead representative on Kanzak relations, and she has worked so hard on this alliance with so many other international politicians. She also serves on the Justice Committee and the Joint Committee of Medical Assisted Dying. So thank you, Carrie Lynn, for joining us today. Thank you very much. I look forward to it. So we always like to start our interview with a question and answer segment where we ask four questions asked by our high school members from across Ontario and across Canada. So question one comes from uh, Jack in Milton and he asks, since you're the representative on Kanzak relations, what are your thoughts on why Kanzak is a good idea that will benefit Canadians? Well, thank you very much for that question. And Milton's a favorite place of mine. Was a good friend of mine, Lisa Wright, lives there. We used to be seatmates in Parliament, actually, and we're good friends. This is a very important, as we see it, potential for economic recovery, economic diversity through an increased geopolitical alliance with these four countries. Why these four? This is not a new idea. It's something that's been around quite a long time. But because we have so many people to people ties, because, oh, and by the way, the countries, just in case you're not completely sure, it's Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. So those countries, we all share a head of state. We share a common British tradition in both our parliament and our government structure, as well as our laws. I'm a lawyer, as you've heard, as well as a member of parliament. So this appeals to me. We're all part of the Commonwealth, which is a much, much bigger group of countries, of course, but we have that in common. We are also four of what are called the Five Eyes Partners. It also includes the United States. And the Five Eyes Partners already share intelligence. Uh, we do defensive maneuvers together. We share information about national security. In other words, we're trusted friends and allies. So that's all there already. And what we see Kanzik as doing, particularly post-pandemic, as we want to look toward diversifying for purposes of prosperity, economic prosperity and opportunities is a way to do that that will increase those possibilities but also be kind of fun and one of the fun parts of what we see happening is greater mobility for people particularly young people right now uh, if you're under 30 you can get a special kind of work visa and go work in the UK for instance and then you come back home what we'd like to see is those that age be higher, the term be longer, so that those opportunities to work in other countries and get a sense of other cultures that are different than ours, multicultural, multilingual as well, but not exactly the same. It's the adventure, of course, of leaving home somewhat too. But also along with that is better acceptance of foreign credentials. We, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. And we don't necessarily just mean university education, like if you went to University of Auckland, would that degree be accepted here in Canada? It's also um, trades. You know, if you, uh, if you decide you want to be an electrician like my dad or a carpenter like my brother, um, wouldn't it be great if you could go and do that in one of those other countries, even if just for a while, to experience that? And um, I, I think it would be 
pretty cool. Right now, um, Australia and New Zealand have such an agreement between them. And there are certain restrictions, of course, people have to have criminal record checks and stuff like that. But it it's a way to kind of streamline and get faster results for young people for greater mobility. The other thing is that we would like to see a closer alliance with respect to foreign policy, defense and security consultations. Um, that, this is in addition to the five eyes I told you about that building on that foundation. Uh, we have a shared common respect for the rule of law. We believe in human rights. We uh, want to work together even more closely on humanitarian efforts and that sort of thing. Also economies of scale. If we were looking say at large procurements, uh, fighter jets come to mind, maybe naval ships, uh, submarines, things like that. When you're able to do that through a consortium on big, very technical pieces of equipment like that, that can be helpful. When I became Associate Minister of National Defense, which I did before I was Minister of National Revenue, they said, Minister, when it comes to getting equipment, it's all about computers today. So the only difference is whether it flies, rolls, or floats. So basically, <laughs> that is what it's about. It's about computer technology, being able to share communications, but then built within our equipment. And then uh, the last part of it would be expanded trade opportunities. We would like to see that. We have unilateral agreements. Uh, and right now, the government is trying to sign a new agreement with the UK post-Brexit. But really, it's more or less just what we had before, only with a new stamp on it. So what we'd like to see is something a little more meaningful, more unique to these four countries that would free up trade, free up barriers that would help Canadian agriculture producers, uh, that would see a way for greater opportunities for Canadian businesses that want to sell their goods or sell their technology or even sell their ideas within the comfort level of countries that operate business and operate government in a similar way. So we're very enthusiastic about it. There's interparliamentary committees already in the UK and in Australia. They're working on it in New Zealand. We're working on that here. And we want to see it go from just talk to some policy action. Well, that's obviously a lot to unpack. You summed it all up pretty nicely, most of it really nicely. I mean, I think the important thing to pull from that is really sort of working with the nations that we share the most with, share so much in common. We see overseas in the UK, we share so much with them, so many values. Same with Australia and New Zealand, they share so much. And like you said, our parliamentary systems, they're all very similar. So it's just about that mobility and freedom of mobility and being able to do so many more different things. And we won't go on too much longer about this because we have other questions to get on to. But really, I think that Kanzik is a, a pretty good plan. And I think that uh, with people like you sort of making sure that everything's going smoothly, con contributing, looking at everything, I think that we're in good hands to see how that happens. And hopefully it does happen because it would mean a lot to a lot of people in being able to work with them so much more closer. Well, thank you. And I do think it should be a particular interest to anyone in school now and going on in school or going to out into the workforce because this could lead to some really exciting options and opportunities that aren't there right now or aren't as extensive right now. And I'll tell you, for me, I'm meeting some really interesting people on Zoom. I'm talking to senators and parliamentarians in all those countries. I have uh, people from the House of Lords that are interested and involved. And it's a really uplifting kind of endeavor. So it's all for positive. It, it's all for bringing us closer together, sharing more and benefiting from it. So I'm pretty excited about it. I, I hope we're able to make it happen.
especially post-COVID, it's something that's a big, good project to sort of bring the countries together closer so that all the countries can together work better and create a better economy for every single country post-COVID. So the second... Exactly. So the second question is also another big one, but I guess we'll keep it within a reasonable time frame so that we can get to all the questions. But sure. Mackenzie wants to ask, Mackenzie from Burlington asks, many Canadians criticize the Senate as an old and outdated method of legislation. Do you think that Senate reform is possible or needed? And how would you like to see the Senate reformed, if at all? We have in Canada, and thank you for the question. I have relatives in Burlington, so I know where you live. Uh, thank you for the question. It, it's, a, it's a tough question and a complicated one. And sometimes people like to apply simple answers, but it's a little more complicated than that. We have a history, just talking about shared British traditions, of a bicameral legislature. The idea of a bicameral legislature, which by the way was in all the provinces at one time until they let it go, is to have what Sir John A. Macdonald called a place of sober second thought another place where leading Canadians from diverse backgrounds are able to take a look and say, yes, this makes sense, or no, it doesn't, or here's an amendment, or um, we don't like it. That doesn't happen very often. They throw the whole thing out. Sometimes they don't get to it, and there's an election change, and so you have to start all over again. But the idea is to have a place, like in Britain, it's the House of Lords, where they are not as taken up with the, uh, the thrust of day-to-day -day politics and can take a broader view. That's the idea and the ideal. And it should be made up of prominent citizens from all kinds of diverse backgrounds. In other words, a kind of um, a citizenry look at what politicians of the day may be doing. Having said that, I came to believe in an elected Senate like they have in the United States, because I think it's more accountable, more responsible, more representative. The role may be somewhat different, but that does not mean that we cannot have elections for those seats. And the terms may be different as well. A lot of people favor the American idea of a six-year term. So a longer term than MPs are afforded. But that way, the people have the right to say, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? How does this work? You know, it's accountable government. And I tend to favor that idea. Should we get rid of it entirely? I... You know, we hear that from the NDP a lot because the NDP have never formed government, so they've never been able to appoint senators. I don't necessarily agree with that. I can see the need for a second place where people are not as mired, like I say, in the day-to-day -day of parliament to take a look. However, I do think that the members of parliament, particularly because they're duly elected, should have the greater say in what legislation ultimately looks like. Having said all that, right now, I see our Senate as very divided, very truncated because of this move by the Trudeau liberal government to supposedly appoint independent senators, but of course they're not really. And then they have themselves divided into other groups. I think we have now something like five different groups of senators. And it's become hard to fathom how they, it's amazing that they actually can coordinate and and uh, support in order to get legislation passed at all. It, it's, it's become something it never was, and that's all happened in the last few years. And I think really we need to take a deep breath and take a good look at it. What we've said as conservatives is, if the provinces choose to hold elections for who their senators should be, we will appoint those they, they uh, choose. To change the Senate in any real way, and there was a reference to the Supreme Court of Canada about the Senate composition by Prime Minister Harper, it requires constitutional amendment. And without going too long on that one, 
that is not an easy thing to do in Canada. The uh, We do not have as fluid a system of amendments to our constitution as they do in the United States. And it takes the majority of provinces, a majority of the population all agreeing. It takes huge and broad consensus on a complicated subject. So quite frankly, few governments want to uh, go there because of what's involved in true constitutional change, but that's what it would require. Well, that's really, you again, you brought up a lot of good points. I agree with the elected Senate thing. I mean, I saw a thing a while back that said, imagine telling Americans that Canada has an appointed Senate, it would blow their minds because mm -hmm. the Americans, I mean, there's a lot that is said about the Americans. A lot of people poke fun at Americans, but they really like to know what's going on in their Senate. Whereas a lot of Canadians and in, in their politics, they like to see it and they like to have that say, whereas a lot of Canadians don't really pay attention to the Senate as much as they pay attention to the House of Commons. I mean, as bad as it is to say, it's just a lot of people don't really care that much, but that's really important in the Senate. And we see like with Bill C-10, it's passed through the government now, through the House, now it's up to the Senate. And if the Senate wasn't there, it would pretty much, it'd be, it would be scary. Done already. It would be done, exactly. That, so that's, that's the right. good thing. Yeah, and the thing is, I would say one of the reasons for that is when you elect people, you get to know them. It's their job to go out and be known in their community. They, they have to present themselves, say, this is who I am. This is my background. This is why you should choose me. When senators are appointed by government, nobody really knows how that comes about. And that might be someone you've never heard of, you've never met. So the personal connection that comes with elections is lost in the appointment process. And that's pretty much it. And also, like you said, with the new independent MPs, uh, independent senators, it really is concerning when you see Justin Trudeau appointing senators that he calls independent. But I think there was one of them that was appointed that she ran for the Liberal Party twice in the past. That's so right. to call that independent, unless she had a complete change of thought and decided that she didn't agree with them anymore. And I'm not going to go into pointing fingers and you should or shouldn't. It's just a little bit uh, concerning to see that. So the third- Yeah, she's one of their latest appointments. I think she's the mayor of Cambridge or was the mayor uh, of Cambridge? Cornwall, I think, Cornwall. Oh, Cornwall, sorry, yeah. that's right, sorry, yeah. Cornwall. Um, and, you know, fine, uh, she may be well suited to it, but yes, yeah, she has been a liberal candidate twice. Exactly. So the third question comes from Vasu and Durham, and it's more of a question about what do we do next in terms of the government? We've seen so many different things that the government has done, the current liberal government, all the scandals they've committed, the WE charity scandal, the SNC-Lavalin, everything. So what do you think, what type of action do you think should be taken on the current liberal government for all the scandals that they've committed in well, thank you. And if you're in Durham, I hope you'll volunteer for Erin O'Toole's campaign. <laughs> um, with respect to the ultimate contribution every Canadian can make is to vote him out of office, vote them out of office. I mean, as long as they're in charge, particularly if they're in a majority, it is very hard to fight against other than make it known publicly. And if a majority government is formed, that's four years before the government has to call an election again. So the number one thing is to get out and contribute time and energy to campaigns to remove them from office. The scandals that they have been responsible for have not been adequately covered by the press. And if there was someone from the media here, they would say, well, we covered them. Yes, you did report that they existed, but you didn't follow up. You didn't dog them like you would have dogged uh, Prime Minister Harper, for instance. The, the outrageous things that the Prime Minister himself has been involved in blackface, brownface so many times that he doesn't remember, doesn't want to be held to account because he's not sure. For someone 
who claims that uh, he stands, he's the only one who stands for uh, visible minorities, to call himself a feminist prime minister when it seems every strong woman, capable woman who he deals with ends up either being pushed out by him or leaving themselves. Leona Alislev crossed the floor to our party. Uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould was effectively pushed out. Jane Philpott, very capable minister. All the conservatives thought she's very capable too. Would have led through the pandemic uh, so much better than Patty Hyde. Oh <laughs> my goodness, she would have just been a breath of fresh air and knowledgeable and sensible and reasonable and intelligent, all those good things. Um, she is gone. Other people who didn't run uh, the... Uh, MP from Whitby, the MP from West Vancouver. I mean, it, it, the list goes on and on and on. And, you know, so that hypocrisy has to be voted out. People have to vote against it. Also on their ethical challenges, we have never had a prime minister before even investigated for ethics violations. And now Trudeau's had so many, we number them. Trudeau one, Trudeau two, Trudeau three. It's incredible. But it's not just him. It's his ministers. Harjit Sajjan, Minister of Defense, saying that the issue of sexual misconduct in the military really isn't his issue. Yes, it is. The, the head of our national defense is the minister. Then the associate minister, if there is one, and I had that role for a brief time and enjoyed it. And then it's the deputy minister and the chief of defense staff and on you go. He has a duty and a responsibility as a minister, which he has completely walked away from. And it's, that is scandalous. The we scandal, look, they specifically kind of gave a pass to Trudeau, even though his family benefited in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. But they slammed Morneau. Well, Morneau is now conveniently gone, but he was the most powerful minister in the cabinet next to Trudeau for years. And that person is so compromised that he really can't come back. There, there's example after example of the attorney general, the minister of justice and um, other ministers being directly involved in um, picking uh, judicial appointments, picking federal board appointments from a lib from their liberal list, from their donor database. It, it, it just goes on and on. So there's lots for conservatives to point to, lots for conservatives to criticize. What we would do differently is we would bring in much stronger anti-corruption laws. We would bring in much stronger penalties to enforce our pledge to greater accountability, greater transparency. And, you know, Trudeau said all those things in the last election. And he has proven them all to be untrue. So he should be held to account. But the best way is through the Canadian public. Because the levers of government, they're just not strong enough. A $200 fine for conflict of in interest and ethics breaches is not going to hurt the millionaire son of a millionaire of a millionaire grandfather. Well, that's exactly it. And you talked a lot about just people having to pay attention. Like you said, with the media, they really didn't follow up on it. Like you said, like if it was a conservative prime minister, or like, uh, like Prime Minister Harper, or if anybody, any conservative, if that happened to them, I mean, it's easy to point fingers, but it's not just pointing fingers at this point. It's stating the facts. And right. what you said about the election goes perfectly with our next question about uh, how getting going to an election and the voters choosing is the best way to deal with what has happened and show justice and sort of go along and choose who's right so the fourth question comes from the ohsca team and we ask what do you think the members of the conservative party should do right now in order to get ready for the next election which we know will probably be coming sooner rather than later well, I'm glad you said sooner rather than later, because every time I turn around, somebody tells me it's a lot sooner than I 
lot. Well, so, this is coming out in August, so who knows if there's an yes. election at this point that this is premiering. So it it very much <laughs> may be that we'll already be into an election in August. Uh, the latest predictions are just that, which is unusual in and of itself because normally governments will give Canadians give the public a break in the summer and wouldn't expect them to be out volunteering. So I will say that we have to get ready now. We are actively getting our candidates in place. If nominations need to be held, they're being held now uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, someone like myself, I was acclaimed in my candidacy, uh, meaning no one ran against me. So I will be a candidate again in this election and proud to be one for our party. We need volunteers, we need money. Uh, campaigns are run on donations of time and money. More time than money. I mean, we, we're always trying to raise some money, but young people, this is a fantastic opportunity to get to know how politics works, to, to be part of a campaign. I mean, there's so many things that need to be done. Um, runners are needed, phoners are needed. Some of my, one of my best volunteers one time was a 12 year old boy who was homeschooled and his mother let him work in the election <laughs> as part of his uh, homeschooling, which, and he was just devout. He was fantastic. And he was really good on the phones and he sounded older. So people People uh, had no idea they were talking to a 12 year old. The, um, I, I worked on my first campaign in my teens and I would say that, you know, we could really use that help. Also from a conservative point of view, if you're a conservative youth, I think it's really important to be out there and be active and work against this crazy narrative that young people are not conservatives. I know so many fantastic youth who believe in what we're doing, who see, who are intelligent, who investigate, who see how important it is not to keep hurtling towards some form of Canadian socialism in our country and to really reward um, hard work, uh, to understand the opportunities are out there and want to be part of a greater prosperity, who want to help us build out of the pandemic as we started this whole interview, that we need to diversify and find places for Canadian ideas and technology around the world and within our own country. But we need to get busy now. We need to get our campaigns in place, get our candidates in place. We need volunteers. We need help. Uh, and we need to understand how important this election is. We need to change course in Canada. We desperately need to change course. We need to be proud of our Canadian identity with all its flaws. And there are flaws. And we have some real work yet to do with Indigenous people. We've, we've got a lot of that playing out in the media right now, which some of it is very heartbreaking. But we don't erase history. We shouldn't erase history. We should learn from it and improve upon it and take the proud Canada we have and make it an even better place. That's what we should be striving for, not going backwards into divisions and classes and, and dividing up in terms of region and race and, and religion and ethnicity. This is not Canada. Canada is multicultural, multilingual. We're a vibrant place. We're a land of opportunity. And a conservative government is going to fight for that, just like we've been fighting on C10 so we don't have internet censorship, uh, just like we fought all along. And we, we want to do that with you. I mean, your members, the people listening to this, we need you. And we want to be working on a Canada that you're going to be proud of all your lives. Well, that's exactly it. And, uh, I think that it really is important that young people, and we'll get to the next segment very quickly in a couple of minutes, uh, well, not a couple of minutes, but very soon, about young people getting involved. And that's what it is. I mean, I saw a poll recently about how uh, in the polls for uh, for Canada, like party, uh, 
support how in the 18 to 30 range it the conservatives i think are placing in third in youth involvement and youth support and i know that polls aren't completely reflective on the actual um on the actual environment and the actual what's actually happening but it was kind of a shock to me and that's why we at ohsca want to get more young people involved in politics learn about conservatives see what we stand for and that's exactly what it is i really thank you for that question it's so important to the future of canada for all of us no matter what age we are because engagement of voters and future voters is what a democracy is all about and with polls you know they they change <laughs> and it's hard to know, but they are an indication. There's some indication of whether we can't be slaves to them, but on the other hand, I think we can't ignore them either. And I heard a recent poll that uh, among 15 to 30 year olds, I think it was that the NDP was number one, liberal second and conservatives third. Um, you know, I think when we're young, we're trying to figure ourselves out, never mind the world. And we want to contribute, we want to be part of things. But we also tend to, if we're not people who really research and look into things, tend to react emotionally. And we react emotionally all our lives. I'm not saying that's exclusive to young people, but I think emotional messaging often appeals to younger people who have not yet experienced enough to balance it I, either through their parents experiences or their friends experiences or their own experiences are not able yet to balance it with other factors so when you say you know i care deeply about a subject um, then often young people say well that makes sense to me i, I want to care deeply about that too and they move in that direction the NDP and Liberals are very, very good at talking emotionally, and I think that often appeals to young people. Conservatives can do a better job, quite frankly, of communicating who we really are. And who we are are people who marry both our compassion and our caring with the logic of understanding that we need to show our compassion, but we also need to do it within a responsible framework um, economically and from a governance point of view. I think many people I've heard say, well, liberals uh, win elections and, and conservatives win at governance. You know, we're, we're very good and competent at governing. We're not always, we tend to be kind of humble, to be honest. We tend not to want to sing our own praises and say, well, you know, I did this or I did that. But I think conservatives have to frankly do a better job for youth of conveying how compassionate we are. Some of the most philanthropic, caring, um, sacrificing people I know are conservatives, but they also tend to have humility and think maybe I shouldn't talk about all that I'm doing. And I'm not saying we lose our humility. What I'm saying is we don't have to dig down into the specifics, but we need to convey our true hearts which are compassionate hearts. So I like to think of us as compassionate conservatives and I think we need to do more of that messaging. And we need people who already, youth who already identify as conservative to definitely get out and join in uh, the election, join in as volunteers and just be part of it. And then at least you can say, you know what? My candidate won and I was part of that. Or you know what? My candidate didn't win, but we came awful close and we really fought hard and I feel really good about having been part of that. Besides, you make lots of friends. It, you know, there's nothing like working alongside someone for a common cause to make friendships. That's exactly it. So our last segment is called Advice for the Next Generation. And we ask this question to every single person that comes on our show. So Carrie Lynn, we always like to ask, what do you think that young high school conservatives can get can do to get more politically active? And what is one piece of advice you would give them? I know we already went over this a bit, but a piece of advice you would give them about getting involved. 
I have touched on this quite a bit in my answers, I guess, just naturally. Mm -hmm. So it's a good question. And I would say that when you take your interests and your passions into action is when you really feel a big sense of satisfaction. And as young Canadians, you should care about what your country looks like now and what it's going to look like. You should care about the values of our nation, the fact that we <clears throat> excuse me, that we are a free country and that we are able, you know, there's still today countries, lots of them, where you have to have special papers just to cross town, never mind to go from one province to another. We have a country where you can move, travel, relocate, go to a different school, do, do whatever, um, without having to get authority, authorization from anybody. This is worth standing up for. We have a country that has a constitution and a charter of rights that actually means something. We have elected representatives that win and lose, and that is the people's choice in lots of countries. In China, the, the president of China is now the president for life, self-declared. Um, uh, in some countries, they claim to have elections, but miraculously, the same person gets 95% of the vote every time. That's not how it works here. Here we have a transition of power that's peaceful. We accept the will of the people. So these kinds of things are fundamental to the kind of life and future young people are going to have. So I, I would really encourage everyone who's interested and you people in your association must be or you wouldn't be part of it but really encourage them to get involved in the upcoming election as a volunteer learn more about their nation the good and the bad but don't throw out for a few headlines about things we've done wrong don't throw out all the headlines in your mind of heroism and sacrifice and you only usually need to look back into your own family to find out about how tough it was when there were no safety nets when people came here and had to homestead on land that was barely you know full of rocks you know they and try and grow something in severe climates we talk a lot about the environment today and we all want to be good stewards of the environment and our planet. All of us do. It's not true to say that conservatives don't care about that. We care about it deeply. But we also know that this is not completely new to the here and now. People have suffered through tremendous um, droughts and cold and heat and they did all that to build a country over time that we can be proud of. So I just want to encourage people to keep their passion for their country, keep their passion for this amazing nation that they're lucky enough to have either come to or be born into and be part of it, get active, do something, make some friends and enjoy being part of those outcomes. That's exactly it. And we talk with so many people. And I think the one thing that everybody says is get involved and get involved in anything that you really can in terms of elections. I mean, we've had people come on and say that they started just by putting out lawn signs and they just spent some Saturday mornings just putting some lawn signs out. And that's pretty much it. And then we have people that then put out lawn signs and they started answering phones then they started working in the office then they started going into I don't know being a campaign manager or something I know the jump isn't that quick but you just start to get involved and then if you want to get into politics you have that not really shoe in but you have those connections that experience that you started to work with and that really is it just getting involved and and also to... you can reach out to your MP uh you know, you, there's there's opportunities for volunteer work in MPs offices too, or interning, um, things like that. I've got a, a high school student in my riding who 
the, the program calls me his mentor. He's my protege. But um, I've said to him, just come along with me when I go visit some people in the riding. I'm happy to bring you along and hear how I talk to people, hear how I do things. He thinks he might like to run for office someday. Sometimes people think they want to run for office and I'm saying, you know, I'd rather be uh, back here working in a MP's office or supporting someone. And others say, yeah, this is for me. I I'm very interested. But you need to know what it is that is involved and there's no better way than just to jump in. That's pretty much it. And that is such a good note to end off uh, end the interview on because really it's just finding what you're good at, finding what you enjoy. And if you want to run for office and that's when you enjoy and you have that passion to represent the people in your riding. I mean, we're young people, we can't run for office, but we can definitely be just as important and work with the MP and volunteer on campaigns. And as long as you, if you go out and you volunteer during a campaign, if you can just make one person decide that they're going to vote for the conservative candidate instead of the liberal or NDP or green or whatever other party they want to vote for, then you have done your job right. And you get to have that sort of satisfaction that's saying, I may not be able to vote yet, but I got someone to vote for the conservative candidate that I want to win. Absolutely. And we need that help. We need that support. We want that support. We would welcome it. Any candidate running for us would. And I know I would absolutely welcome it. And I love to have uh, youthful energy and enthusiasm around me. And also I get ideas. I mean, people have different points of view and the way you see things might be different than the next person. And I would personally love to hear that. So I, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today, Vincenzo, and to take the initiative you have to do things like this and to bring conservatives on with, you know, we're all different too, but we have the commonality that we believe in ethics, good governance, and, and creating a bright and brighter future. So I hope, uh, some of what I've had to say resonates with your with your members. That's exactly it. And we really thank you for joining us. We had a good chat about Kansas and the Senate and a nice long chat. We talked a lot about different things and we really thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. We know that things are getting busy. I know, like we've mentioned, there could be an election at any time now. So yeah. getting ready for that, the House is just... Uh, rose the other day so well at the time of this filming so we know it's a busy time so we thank you for joining us we appreciate you for sharing your knowledge with us and we wish you well in everything in the future so that is it we hope you enjoyed today's interview you can look for more videos coming soon make sure to follow our twitter instagram facebook and tiktok accounts at ontario hs cons for more info about our next interview and for more great content make sure to look at our website at ontariohsconservatives.org to learn more about us, see our projects, and for more great content, make sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and click the notification bell so you never miss another video. And we thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you all soon. Mm -hmm.